At this time, we will convene the May 16th meeting of MCE Board of Directors at 6.33 p.m. Um, Madam Clerk, can you please call roll? Belvedere? Manisha? Concord? Here. Contra Costa County? Corte Madera? Here. Danville? Here. El Cerrito? Here. Fairfax? Here. Thank you. Fairfield? Hercules? Here. Lafayette? Here. <clears throat> Larkspur? County of Marin? Here. Martinez? Present. Mill Valley? Moraga? Here. Napa? Here. The County of Napa and four Napa cities? Here. Novato? Here. Oakley? Here. Pinole? Here. Pittsburgh? Present. Pleasant Hill? Here. Richmond? Here. Ross? San Anselmo? Here. San Pablo? Here. San Rafael? San Ramon? Here. Sausalito? Solano? Tiburon? Here. Vallejo? Walnut Creek? Here. Quorum established. Thank you, Jessica. I don't All know right. I don't know if it was recorded, but Belvedere is here. Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item number two, board announcements. Are there any board announcements from our board of directors? All right. Not seeing any here or hearing any. All right, we'll move on to item number three, public open time. This item is an opportunity for the public um, to make any comments that are not on the agenda. Do we have any members of the public that would like to speak? None here in San Rafael, Chair. All right, none here in Concord. Do we have any members of the public from Zoom? All right, hearing none, moving on to item number four. Um, I, uh, would like to speak. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Hi. Uh, are you a member from, um, are you a member of the public from Zoom? Yes, I am. And I was okay. un unmuted, but, uh, oh, okay. just, uh, trying to get started here. Thank you. Yes. Thank uh, you. Uh, my name is David Mahler. I live in Larkspur, and I'm representing the Marin Sonoma Building Electrification and Electric Vehicle Squads, made up of about 100 mostly Marin residents advocating for accelerating building electrification and the transition to electric vehicles. I'd like to thank MCE for conducting the April 10th Community Power Coalition meeting, which focused on MCE's operating reserve fund and ideas for use of potential surplus revenues. I was particularly impressed that all three of MCE's top executives attended the meeting in person to hear firsthand important input from the community. Now, what I heard was strong and broad community support for MCE to greatly increase the scope and funding of its community electrification programs, both for buildings and vehicles, which together account for something like 60 to 80% of fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions in MCE's service area. 
I also heard a strong call for MCE to establish an ad hoc committee, ideally with community representation, to develop a range of priority uses for potential surplus revenues. A key element of MCE's mission is to reduce fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions, and MCE is uniquely positioned to have immediate and significant impact in reducing emissions by increasing the scope and funding of its community electrification programs, especially for building electrification. As an example, every year, 40 to 50,000 gas, space, and water heaters are replaced in MCE's service area. And right now, most of these are being replaced with new gas units that will continue to emit fossil fuels for another 20, uh, fossil fuel emissions for another 20 years. If MCE substantially increased the scope and amount of its incentives to make it less costly to install electric heat pump space and water heaters, rather than replacing burnt out gas models with another gas model, it could radically alter the replacement arc and potentially reduce greenhouse gas emissions by thousands of tons per year. Though the impact would be immediate, the need for increased MCE heat pump incentives is only three to five years and will be unnecessary once BACMED's zero NOx rules take effect for water heaters in 2027 and for space heaters in 29. MCE can still start to fund long-term efforts like acquiring a generation asset, but should take it slow in the near term so as not to miss this fleeting opportunity to have immediate and substantial impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions through a supercharged heat pump incentive program. We request that MCE form an ad hoc committee, ideally with community representation, to identify and recommend potential uses for surplus revenues and that a key targeted use be to substantially increase the scope and funding for MCE's community key electrification programs, especially incentives for heat pump space and water heaters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jessica, do we have any additional public comment um, via Zoom? I see no raised hands, Chair. All right, thank you. Moving on to item number four. Um, our report from our CEO. I'll pass it over to you, Don. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, we are trying a new format for this report that includes some visuals uh, to make it a little more interesting and uh, maybe memorable. So let's uh, pull up our slides here. I wanted to start off by um, letting the board know that the California Community Choice Association, which MCE helped form years ago, hosted its annual conference in San Jose last month. And you can go to the next slide. We've got a photo from that event. Um, we had uh, some of our board members participate. And so just wanted to do a, a shout out and a thanks to Vice Chair Quinto, Directors Darling, Multiac, Murphy, and Pere, and Thayer. Um, thank you so much uh, to all of you for joining us and representing MCE. Um, and for those of you that weren't able to make it, I wanted to let you know that MCE was honored with three community impact awards. And um, this was exciting because we were uh, distinguished from our peers with uh, the most accolades and we were the only CCA to receive more than one award. The awards were for, for MCE's SYNC program that um, y'all have heard us talk about. It's the EV charging app that is shifting load away from those evening hours. Um, that was in the decarbonization category. And then in the equity in energy efficiency category, we won an award for our home energy savings program. We're going to hear more about that next month. So you'll get a full report on how that's going. Um, and then in the reliability category, we won an award for our customer energy storage program, which um, we'll also talk about next month. The awards were judged by the California Air Resources Board, Gateway City, Council of Governments, and the U.S. Green Building Council, and presented by the California Energy Commission Chair, David Hochschild. Um, so that was a, a great event um, and just wanted to congratulate everyone for the great outcomes there. Also, um, while we're talking about events, I wanted to let folks know that today the Power Association of California held its annual seminar in San Mateo, and um, it was well attended also um, with a lot of discussion around electricity, reliability, transmission infrastructure, uh, many of the issues that we've been talking about here at the at the board level um, with some great uh, information about how the uh, regional 
growth of uh, transmission planning and um, and increasing uh, market trading across states is is uh, moving moving forward. So I'm feeling optimistic after being at that conference, and um, you'll be hearing more in the coming months about some of the next steps on on those issues. And then let's go to the next slide. I wanted to pass along some exciting milestones that we've seen just in recent months here. Uh, we've seen a, a big increase in the um, use of renewable energy sources. And um, just to be super clear, what I'm talking about is wind, geothermal, small and large hydroelectric, solar and battery power. We've seen record energy achievements, and and so these stats are as of yesterday. We've exceeded grid demand 61 of the last 69 days with renewable energy compared to only seven days all of last year. So that's a pretty big increase. The average wind, water, solar supply has been 62.3% uh, and um I won't read all of these in detail, but I think the one that jumps out the most at me as the one at the bottom where we're seeing that batteries have peaked at 7.2 gigawatts on May 7th at 8.30 p.m., which is wow. right when we need those batteries because the sun has gone down by then. Um, the batteries have been charged up by the solar energy and they're doing their job by getting energy back onto the grid in the evening. So it's really exciting to see that um, on this particular day, they provided almost 30 percent of all grid demand at, at 8.30 p.m. So we're excited to see that. Uh, we're expecting to see more batteries getting interconnected each year over the next few years. And so we're hoping that's going to really help um, balance out some of those extreme load shifts that we've seen on the grid. Um, and then uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, Vic, yeah, sure. Five or ten minutes, those renewables are carrying the entire load. Yeah. Many, many hours, but yeah. We can't Correct. hear you on Tinnerfell. So uh, my, I was saying that that could be as short as five minutes in the day, or it could be five hours. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and as many the of the fact that we're doing it sixty-one out of sixty-nine days, it really is remarkable. Yeah. So that it's showing that. We are making progress. We are making progress. And as we've talked about before, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District has some new goals for electrification that's going to increase demand even more. And that's really exciting. Um, I wanted the board to know that we've been working with uh, with them, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, on strategies and um, uh, trying to bring in funding to help with incentives so that folks can start making that transition to electric uh, heat pump water heaters and, uh, and other uh, devices. So we'll keep you all posted on how that's going. And um, Vicken's going to say a little bit about this next slide. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, like we just talked about, a lot of coverage from renewables for the state of California. Now we have a lot of sunshine. So this is this covers a whole day for May 14, and it shows that you know you you can follow the charts about solar, wind, geothermal, small hydro, large hydro batteries, and then the red line on top is the demand. When you add up in the middle of the chart around uh, noonish you see that the, we have more resources in at least uh, Calif inside California than there is load. So the rest of that is being uh, exported, traded, what have you, uh, bringing a lot of generation to their uh, EMIN levels. So that is really good. I would like to bring your attention to the dark blue to the left of the uh, graph and to the right of the graph. So those are the batteries. They are discharging a little bit right before the ramp, but the majority of them, they are already charged, like Don said uh, a couple of minutes ago, from a lot of the renewables, and they are really helping the discharge in the late in the afternoon. So that's where thousands of batteries are coming to help us for the state of California reliability. The only thing on the other side of the coin is, sorry, there's a little bit of not so positive news, is in situations like this is when we have significant amount of curtailments of our solar contracts. Um, and especially in Southern California where prices go negative and there's a lot of congestion with not enough transmission. 
And that's one of the reasons why we had briefed the board about possibly investing in uh, advanced technologies to relieve congestion for a couple of our resources. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, before you go on, in the 1, 2, 3, 4 a.m., there's a great big white gap. What fills that gap? Those are thermal resources that are serving uh, between the addition of the green, reddish, and the blue. Those are the thermal resources and, you know, nuclear, too, that is covering that. And there would be a lot of imports. Natural gas is the primary resource. Yeah. Yeah. So the, all the different colors are showing the clean energy, the wind, water, and solar. And the the white spaces are where we don't have enough renewables to meet the demand. Um, I know that the font is really small on this slide, so I'll just make sure it's super clear that the red line going across the top is the demand in California on a day starting at uh, the middle of the night, zero o'clock, um, the the very middle of the chart is 12 o'clock noon, and the very end of the chart is 11:59 uh, p.m. So the you know the sun obviously is providing all that yellow solar in the middle of the day, and it gets to where that red demand line is meeting up with the the solar generation. Um, but on some days, there's so much solar, as Vicken was saying, that it's more than we need, and uh, and unfortunately, that's where it's getting curtailed and and not getting used. Just one more addition, sorry. Um, uh, when we had uh, described our procurement strategies, just to put it in perspective, the left side and the right side of the graph is where we're trying to reduce the load to meet our resources. And in the middle portion where there is, at this time of the year, more renewables, we want to move, shift the load to over there to, to be served, just to put it in perspective. You know, just as just as a comment, if uh, if you haven't if you weren't listening to the radio, uh, Gav, uh, Governor Newsom issued a press release today on clean energy and how much of a lead we have over the rest of the country, and specifically that slide. So I don't know if you had any you know uh, opportunity to ghostwrite on his behalf, but uh, you should be getting some credit for that. Hope. Thank you so much. And just to put a final a final thought as we are about to depart from this slide, our goal at MCE is to bring that red line down at the same time we're bringing all the other colors up so that we are meeting our supply and our demand at all hours of the day with um, fossil-free resources. Can I and that's go? why all of our contracts now have a storage component? All of our solar contracts have solar a storage gap. component. Um, so the other technologies do fill in some of those gaps already, particularly geothermal and biomass um, and wind uh, to some degree it tends to produce more in the evening and the morning hours. Director Zorn. Thank you. Just a real quick follow-up uh, to your point. Are, were you joking or are you serious that there was this slide? Oh, okay. Gotcha. We can't hear you in San Rafael. Uh, he was commenting for X number of days. This is what we were able to achieve. I see. But he said we were 100% renewable. <laughs> so if for this particular case, I, I I feel like I bring this up every so often, and I'll just bring it up again. So um, it's great how close we are to the demand, uh, but we do have deep green uh, customers. So if I am a deep green customer at one o'clock in the morning and I turn my lights on, am I getting deep green uh, power or am I getting, what am I getting? Such a great question and a really important question because of some of the things we've been talking about lately. So this is an hour by hour view of our usage and our generation. But usually, well, in the market, renewable energy is accounted for on an annual basis. So if you're a deep green customer, we buy enough um, renewable energy to serve your load on an annual basis. But we don't yet have a product that can serve our deep green customers on an hourly basis. But we are exploring a pilot program that would do that. Um, 
it is not possible right now economically to buy all the resources we need. There's not enough availability, um, but we are moving in that direction. That is a, a goal that we have. John, can one more thing, the red line in the middle, it's less than there are resources. So th there is less load than we have green, clean green resources. So that's the beauty of this season. Please turn your uh, electricity on at noon. Everything on, yeah, yes. Exactly. <laughs> Before we move on to the next slide, can we see if there's any um, comments from San Rafael, Jessica? Yes, there's a couple of comments here, Director Martinez and Director Wilkinson. Yeah, I, I was curious about the use of batteries in the morning. Is that, um, uh, I see that the batteries uh, go down in the evening and then there's a little bit of uh, battery usage in the morning. Is that people with batteries not using the electricity until they wake up and then they go, revert to their batteries or what? Yeah, Director Martinez, this is uh, from the California ISO. So right. all this is from the grid. This is not households. This is the net from the households. Okay, so, 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 so these are grid level batteries that had a uh, remaining amount of charge that could help the system as the load was coming in in the morning and thermal assets like gas fired assets are going away. So there's a little bit of that battery on the system, maybe a couple thousand megawatts. But in the afternoon, after all that charge in a lot of the daytime where there's a lot of sunla sunlight, there's several four or 5,000 megawatts of discharging going on in the afternoon from grid level, large resources, batteries. So so the usage in the morning is, is from, uh, I don't understand. Yeah, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, so it's the same batteries that got charged up the day before they only get used, you can see at the end of the day, they're getting used, they're getting used, but the demand starts to taper off. So some of that uh, battery supply is saved and used in the morning as people are waking up and starting to use more electricity. Does that make sense? Some well, well, the usage is still way, the demand is way over. So, so I don't see why they don't discharge, uh, uh, until the batteries are, are 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 empty instead of waiting until that specific hour. Yeah, so th they are doing that. Uh, most of the battery systems, they have a 20% minimum requirement not to go below that because they damage themselves. And this, they are allowed most of the time to do a complete discharge for a complete charge, not more than once a day. So they're living within those physical parameters and warranty limitations on the, the grid level. So like Don said, on the, in the morning, very uh, like 5, 5.30, those are the remnants. There's a little bit left in the grid level batteries that they're discharging to help the system. And then they go into charging mode. And in the afternoon, they're discharging again. Okay, I, I won't beg. Hi, Vic, and I, I just had um, a few a few questions. The first one was that the chart there is uh, for the California grid in aggregate, and I was curious to know whether that profile um, is is pretty similar to MCEs. And I know it's a specific a specific day, but are our is our demand supply very similar to that in terms of the profile? For the time of the year, yes. Okay, and then the second question um, was. Um, on an annual accounting basis, I think we're like, I don't know the number, 90% or something, GHG free. And I was wondering when you do that calculation on an hourly accounting basis, what that number comes out at. Oh, uh, <clears throat> that is something we need to go through in calculating. I do not know at this time. No we idea. We do not have the tools yet, but we are working on it. Actually, PUC is looking at that as well. Okay. And then the third thing was just a, a surprise from me, and maybe it's the time of year that I had no idea that demand was so high during the night time. And so can you, yeah. is that, is that the time of year or what explains that strength of demand overnight? Yeah, that's uh, showing about 22,000. That's pretty low for California. 
uh, it goes to about 54, 55,000 uh, summer peak, a uh, hot day. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a low, low day uh, at about in the afternoon around uh, 9 o'clock or so, hitting about 28,000 megawatts. That's, that's pretty normal. I mean, low, low day for California. So what is all, the, all that power that's being used during the night time? What? Big, yeah, well, uh, you, in, we have a lot of charging going on. That's so that we're shifting load into that, like EV charging and the grid level charging that's going on. This is showing only the resource type availability that is green. So, uh, like, to be honest with you, around uh, like Christmas, New Year's time, the lights in the state of California are about 3,000 megawatts. So, and that's with shifting to LED. So this is a low load day, and that's the reason why, uh, Director Wilkinson, we have quite a bit of curtailments also. As the load increases with heat wave, curtailments decrease a little bit. So I'm giving you the other side of the story too. But that's a pretty much minimum load for California. Um, yeah, just following up on that, I my guess uh, is that the demand curve shown there is actually not only demand, but it's also there's behind the meter solar that people have on their houses. Yeah, you're and correct. This is a net. When, and a so net that's demand why, number. right? And so the net the, the the at night there's no solar coming onto people's houses, so that's the full demand. And in the day, we're only seeing a little bit of the demand because all the rooftop solar. I just wanted to uh, to just I've mentioned this at the, at the tech committee, so sorry for the repetition, but uh, this is very exciting. And clearly, if we had a lot more batteries, we would be doing fantastically. And uh, I just I think that it's probably pretty soon now that we're going to be seeing the uh, the advent of bidirectional chargers for EVs, which represents a massive amount of batteries. So I would really think uh, this is something that MC can focus on in the next few years to try to figure out, it's going to be complex, but try to figure out how to how to manage that resource and uh, try to get, get people to use those bi-directional chargers and bi-directional EVs and, uh, and be able to access that battery resource. Thank you. Um, should I continue or I'm almost done? Yes. Okay. I'll try and wrap up quickly here so we can jump into our agenda. Um, just real quick, I wanted to let folks know that um, we were able to participate in 11 Earth Day events uh, last month in Contra Costa Marin, Napa, and Solano. We spoke to more than 600 community members, including 58 students at San Rafael High School. Um, and you can see some photos from uh, some of the different events we participated in. And then last slide, let's move on to the, I think it's our last slide, yep. Um, we are seeing some record retention rates. And um, I just wanted to do a shout out to our customer care team that we moved in house about two years ago. We have an amazing team of folks that are um, MCE staff that take all of the calls that come in uh, from our customer base. The service center achieved a 42% retention rate, which is 137 customers in April who called in to opt out and were able to get uh, information that they needed and change their mind and decided to uh, to stick with MCE after getting some of their questions answered. And this is compared to a 4% average retention rate with third-party service providers. So it's one of the benefits um, you'll often see in our budget as MCE has grown, we'll often take functions that are, uh, uh, initially outsourced to vendors, bring them in-house um, to achieve a bit of cost savings, but also to have a bit more um, control and engagement with the way those um, functions are being handled. Um, so just a, a real shout out to our four customer success advisors. Um, two are bilingual English, Spanish, and um, you can see them all here. So that is it for my report. Happy to take any more questions. Are there any additional questions from directors for Don? I just had a comment. 
All right. Um, would you, you like to? Okay, okay. I didn't know if you heard me. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to really say something about uh, the CCA conference. And um, I know there's some other folks in the room that attended. And uh, it was a fabulous experience. So any director that can attend in the future, I, I really hope you will. And I want to let you know that every award that MCE got was so well deserved. And when you walk around the conference, um, you know, the, the, the people sitting around this table who are staff, they are the leaders in the industry. All the rest of the CCAs look at, at our staff for the, for the gospel. They wait for the words to come out of their mouths and they really look at MCE as, as the leader their programs are patterned after MCE, and MCE actually helps a lot of other CCAs uh, with strategies towards funding. They help them with programming. They help them set up uh, their CCAs. So I just want to let you know how proud I was of all of our staff. Um, you know, nobody acted really crazy or, or did something funny. But anyway, I was very proud of all of our staff and very proud to be on the board of MCE. So I want to give a big shout out uh, to our fearless leader, Dawn, and everyone else. I'm not going to name anyone else because I'm going to leave someone out. But all the staff, it was really a fabulous experience to spend time with you. I learned a whole lot. There's a reason why Justin's name tag says the goat on it. Now California really knows. Well, thank you all for that. And I just want to echo those same sentiments. I know I got a chance to go to the conference last year. And I mean, just about everyone will come up and say how much you have helped them, Don, to get started. Uh, with their CCA um, and as well as, you know, nothing but accolades for staff. So when MCE is in the room and we're at those conferences, you know, it's almost like you're the celebrity in the room because they're all excited to come and say nothing but great things about MCE. So thank you. All right, moving on to our consent calendar. So we will... Um, be reviewing three items on the consent calendar. So um, C1, C2, and C3. Are there any questions from our directors or comments? On right. adoption of the consent calendar. Thank you, Director Perkins. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Director Zorn. Um, may I, um, Madam Clerk, can you please call roll? Yes. Palvadier? Yes. Concord? Yes. Corte Madera? Yes. Danville? Yes. El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Thank you. Hercules? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Moraga? Aye. Napa? Yes. The County of Napa and four Napa cities? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Nevado? Yes. Oakley? Yes. Pinole? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Pleasant Hill? Yes. Richmond? Yes. San Anselmo? Yes. San Pablo? Yes. San Ramon? Yes. Tiburon? Yes. Walnut Creek? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Moving on to our next item, board members' additions to committees. Um, this item will be introduced by MC's Chief of Staff, Jamie. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, you may recall that we recently reviewed and updated our committee memberships in February, and the rosters that you have here in your packet reflect the current committee memberships. And we're revisiting this topic tonight for two primary purposes. Uh, the first is to provide an opportunity to any board member who would like to join one of our standing committees or to change their current commitment to a committee in their assignment. And the second reason is to uh, create a new ad hoc capital projects committee. And in a moment, Vicken will give us an overview of uh, what will be involved with that committee and what par participating in that committee might involve. Um, but before we get into that, I would like to first address any changes that board members would like to make to existing standing committees. And we can start with the executive committee. So if you're interested in joining or changing your assignment to the executive committee, I would request that you please indicate so now, and we'll be tracking it here. So if you can um, state your name and the community for tracking purposes, that would be great. So are there any requests to join the executive committee or change uh, your current assignment to it? All right. Um, well, the next committee request is about the technical committee. Are there any requests to join the technical committee or change uh, your assignment to that committee? Uh, Dion Hercules. Hercules, great. All right. Are there any others? And Jamie, if I could um, circle back to the executive committee for just a moment, because I know yes. um, Director Nakamura is not able to was not able to be here tonight, but is interested oh. in joining. Oh my good! Oh wow! Okay, I'm so sorry. I was yeah wondering if <laughs> I was looking. She the wrong would speak direction. up. Okay, but... good. Yeah, we just I didn't hear you. So we're all, yeah, she... we're all set. I actually didn't. We didn't hear anything over here. Did anyone make a request for the executive committee, Director Nakamura? We had previously. I'm sorry, I'm confused. She had expressed interest. Oh, um, she had, you had previously this expressed. A, yes, I'm sorry. This is a meeting that ha that occurs during the daytime, right? Yes, and this is the meeting that your alternate is very eager to participate in on your behalf whenever you're not available, which I I know might be very frequently. So, yeah, which is okay. So I think we should maintain this how things are. So you're willing? Does that mean you're comfortable joining the executive committee? and then your alternate would participate? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> great. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, great. So confirming that we will add Concord to executive committee and uh, Hercules to the technical committee. Are there any other requests for the executive or technical committee? All right, hearing none, I will hand it off to Vicken to talk to us about the ad hoc capital projects committee. Go ahead, Vicken. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. So as we had discussed uh, previously, we want to establish with board approval the ad hoc uh, capital projects committee. This is where we will bring in the um, uh, the three fundamental areas that we, we briefed the board previously about uh, where to invest capital projects as ownership. One is a possible the possibility of an MCE office space. Second one is a technology-based uh, transmission asset to re significantly reduce or eliminate some of the uh, major uh, curtailments that we are seeing in a couple of our projects. And the third one is possible uh, in investment opportunities in ownership of a green greenhouse gas-free generation resource. So... We will go, through, once this ad hoc committee is established, we will, our intent is to bring in um, and dive into a little bit deeper into our risk assessment. Like previously, we had briefed the technical committee, executive committee, and the board in what we were seeing in our portfolio. And then as opportunities come up to see where it is that we may have a an investment opportunity to to discuss about that and what are the things that we are taking into consideration 
And again, not financially uh, only, but also on the risk assessment. So like one example I can give you is that uh, for the past five to six years, when we did, when we used to do open season uh, requests for proposals, we received more than 100 to 120 bids into our uh, RFPs. This time we received 12. And two are something we can proceed with given the uh, lack of availability of resources, lack of material, lack of interest, the scarcity of resources, and therefore third parties are not interested in bidding. So just as another component of what is risk to meet our compliance obligations at the PUC. How many, how many megawatts of what type of resources we are obligated to have, for example, for the shutting down of the Diablo Canyon power plant. That 2,200 megawatts needs 15,500 megawatts of solar and battery to replace it. And there's not much coming. So what are our risks? What are our duties to our customers in lower rates, our duties for our reserve obligations and things of that sort? We wanna bring all that into a discussion and deep dive into this committee. And like several uh, participants from the Kampau meeting that we got quite a few positive statements, the intent is to, when the board members are comfortable with what we have seen in the discussions, in the deeper dives, to open it up when we have a mutual opportunity to discuss it with the public, to do that as well and take your input. You can take your questions, what have you. The staff is there to professionally help you and assist you in making sure that MC's vision and mission are met. So with that, if there are any questions, I can take it, but uh, we gotta uh, need to take any volunteers from the board to do this deep dive. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Director Perkins? Uh, I volunteer. Oh. Director Meadows also. We can, can, do you mind if I interrupt with a question first? Oh. Sure, um, go ahead. So, um, you know, we've heard a lot from um, members of the public and uh, various community groups that you've met with, as well as members of the executive committee, members of the board that have um, uh, expressed a desire to have a broader discussion about the use of, of excess reserves, um, including discussions of electrification programs, demand response, bi bi-directional charging, a whole bunch of other things, potentially reducing rates. Um, and I'm, I just want to understand whether the way this committee is being um, established, are you taking those, those uh, possibilities off the table and saying the only use for excess funds is to buy assets, or is this just part of a broader discussion of use of those excess funds? Yeah, at, um, so th th my intent, what I would like to propose to at this ad hoc committee to discuss all facets that you talked about and see what is it that we provided to in those public meetings as assistance that we already provide to our customers and millions of dollars that is there. And again, at the end of the day, it's board's decision what would like to propose. But the this ad hoc committee's primary function is to guide MCE on where to invest capital to reduce, if not eliminate, risk while meeting our compliance and fiduciary duty obligations. The, um, the, the we can discuss it at at, at length and what it means to further electrify and further help because we have over $150 million available in our uh, funded projects for the next dozen years. And we are continuing to do that with assisting the customer base significantly. Our VPP project is going like crazy in helping others from panel upgrades to 0% interest loans. Long story short, we can look at those things. Uh, but again, the primary focus is where to invest capital to reduce, if not eliminate risk in those three areas. 
Right. And uh, so I, I agree. I think it's a it's a really important um, exercise, but there are lots of ways to reduce risk uh, beyond investing in in assets. Um, and so um, I know you keep saying that that purchasing assets will reduce risk and as a sort of as a full statement. And I think uh, that's more complicated potentially. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious whether at the end of this exercise, you, there's a possibility that you just reach the conclusion that actually buying assets does not reduce risk and introduces a whole bunch of other risks to the table. And that's what this ad hoc committee is trying to establish. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. okay thank yeah. you. Sure. All right. So Jamie question. at the, mo oh, I had a quick question before I say, yes, I want to be on the committee. Um, how, when do you want to meet and how often? A really good question. Uh, ooh. I think we should start meeting probably by no later than July. Uh, we have a lot of prep work to do. Uh, Director Fong, you asked us to put like a straw man proposal sometime back. Um, that was quite difficult, if not impossible to do, because we don't have an item to talk about. And to talk about an item would be absent of the risk assessment of like Director Wilkinson mentioned about diminishing risk and some increasing risk that we do not even have at this time, right? Different responsibilities. So I would really like to bring the board's membership in under, or being on the same page as to what we are looking at, what are our challenges are, because um, to be honest with you, the Transmission operating owners and the uh, operators of the California grid are not interested in CCA zoning transmission, even if we wanted to. The third parties by generation asset owners, they like to control the generation assets and continue doing PPAs, even though there is so much scarcity in uh, Don and staff had participating at the PUC to influence the PUC to look at the scarcity at price controls and things like that. And, Maybe Stephanie can talk a little bit later, but those things are barely coming along about the level of maturity that we need in California to talk about what are markets outside of California ISO, like the resource adequacy market. So yeah. I'm sorry for the lengthy answer, Director Darling, but we're looking at it holistically and how to bring it in. And of course, involve the public as well when when we are all, you are all comfortable with it. Okay, in that case, I'll tentatively volunteer and then we'll see what you really mean. Okay. <laughs> Vicky, now I would like to volunteer as well for that committee. Yeah, and Dion yeah. from Hercules. Okay. I, I'd like to volunteer as well. Holly from uh, Tiburon. Okay. Thank you, Director Thiel. And uh, this is Dave Fong. I'd like to do the same uh, with one comment. Uh, this is another level of due diligence that I think the board has been asking for as you explore these opportunities. So from a point of view perspective, I think it would be valuable to have the board's participation on this committee as you take a look at alternatives and options, including asset purchases as well. Thank you. And did I also hear Director Meadows volunteering? Okay. Yes. So Jamie, just to repeat, so you'll know who from Conquer, uh, we have Director Bailey, Director Darling, Director Perkins, Director Fong, Director Meadows, and I think that's it. Uh, I'd I'd like to put my name in the hat or put put, put the hat hat on the name. Uh, that's right. In other words, I'd like to be on the committee. That's Director Martinez. Yes. All right. Do we have any directors via Zoom that would like to join? We don't want to leave you out. I see no raised hands, Chair. All right. Chair, the, sorry, this weekend. Yes. The, the one thing we need to check to see if with the all the volunteers, which we wholeheartedly think, if there is a limit that bumps against TechCom or XCOMs, uh, 
limits. Go ahead, Carolina. Yeah, Joel, we're okay. Actually, okay. this is Jamie. I've been monitoring that and we are good. We are not creating a quorum of any of the standing committees with the current requests. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it and looking forward to it. All right. I'm turning it back over to you, Jamie, unless that's it for that's all. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. And I and I think we need a motion on this item. Ah, thanks. Yes. So moved. Second. All right. Um, please call roll. Belvedere. Yes. Concord. Yes. Puerto Madera? Yes. Danville? Yes. El Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Hercules? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Moraga? Aye. Napa? Yes. The County of Napa and four Napa cities? Yes. Novato? Yes. Oakley? Yes. Pinal? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Pleasant Hill? Yes. Richmond? Yes. San Anselmo? Yes. San Pablo? Yes. San Ramon? Yes. Tiburon? Yes. Walnut Creek? Yes. Motion carries. All right. Next, we'll move on to item number seven. We have MCE's proposed, proposed load management standards plan which will be introduced by MC's manager of policy. Thanks all. Uh, yeah, good evening. My name is Sabrina Soldovini, uh, manager of policy, and I'm also joined tonight by Justin Kudo, senior strategic analysis and rates manager, uh, who will be available to also answer any questions you all may have for us uh, at the end of my short presentation. Uh, but tonight, staff is recommending that you approve MCE's proposed Load Management Standards, or LMS, plan as submitted to your board on March 29th and authorize staff to submit the proposed plan to the California Energy Commission, or CEC, within 30 days of board adoption. And, and to start off, I'd like to provide just a little bit of background and context as to why we're bringing this plan to you all for consideration. And so the CEC approved modifications to its load management standards that went into effect in April of 2023. And those amendments to the load management standards are intended to encourage automated load shifting of electricity to off-peak hours to reduce peak electricity demand, better balance electricity supply and demand, and provide clean, affordable electricity to Californians. And to accomplish the goals of the load management standards, the CEC asks load serving entities like MCE to pu publish all of our current and future time dependent rates into a CEC rate database called MIDAS so that customers and their devices can more easily access current rate information that can be utilized to automate changes to demand. And additionally, the load management standards request that by July of 2025, MCE develop and propose marginal cost-based rates that vary at least hourly, so what I'll call dynamic rates, for all customer classes that for which the board determines those dynamic rates would materially reduce peak usage, or if your board finds that implementing dynamic rates would not materially reduce peak load or be cost effective, offer load flexibility programs that allow for automated responses with signals in the CEC's MIDAS database that I just mentioned. Uh, but the main reason we're discussing this tonight is that the load management standards also ask MCE to create and submit to your board for approval a plan outlining how MCE intends to meet the goals of the load management standards and to evaluate the cost effectiveness, equity, and benefits to the grid and customers of dynamic rates. Uh, and I'll just mention that the load management standards also state 
that the board can approve a plan that modifies the timelines outlined in the load management standards if the board finds that the timelines requested um, in the load management standards would not be cost effective, equitable, or feasible to implement. Uh, and really importantly, uh, I just want to note that the CEC does not have jurisdiction over MCE rate making. That responsibility and authority uh, to determine what rates MCE offers to its customers lies solely with your board. However, because MCE shares the CEC's goals and objectives to better align electricity supply and demand and to encourage automated load shifting away from peak periods, MCE has created this plan for your consideration, which outlines the steps that we plan to voluntarily undertake by July 1st, 2025, and which align with the goals of the load management standards. And so a quick high level summary of what's included in the plan. Really, MCE's plan is intended to meet the goals and objectives of the load management standards while also minimizing risk and cost to MCE and its customers. As reflected in the proposed plan, MCE is interested in exploring and studying what types of new dynamic rates and program offerings we may be able to cost effectively offer to our customers that will materially reduce peak load and provide grid benefits and cost savings to our customers. However, at this time, MCE does not currently have the data necessary to determine that offering dynamic rates will be cost effective, materially reduce peak load, or offer incremental benefits beyond our current rate and program offerings for any customer class. And so as such, uh, MCE's proposed plan finds that it is currently necessary to modify the CEC's requested timeline for dynamic rate development and recommends the board approve um, MCE's plan, which states that MCE staff may, but is not required to submit dynamic rates and programs to your board for approval by July 1st of 2025. And again, we think this modification of the CEC's requested timeline is, is necessary to ensure staff can continue to gather and fully evaluate the data necessary to determine the cost effectiveness, equity impacts, and benefits to customers of any future dynamic rate offerings. And in the interim, we plan to continue to offer our portfolio of current and planned load flexibility programs aimed at encouraging customers to shift their energy use to off-peak hours. Uh, and that includes programs like MCE's Peak Flex Market Program, uh, MCE Sync, our Managed Electric Vehicle Charging Program, uh, and MCE's Richmond Virtual Power Plant Pilot, which is expected to launch next year. And additionally, uh, we will plan to continue to offer all of our current time-dependent rates and and uh, we'll continue to explore how we may offer new cost-effective dynamic rates, pilots, and load flexibility programs that can materially reduce peak load, encourage load control through automation, and provide reliability and environmental, environmental benefits for MCE and its customers. Uh, and we'll, we will continue to provide the board and the CEC with updates as we progress in our evaluation. Um, but with that, I kind of open it up um, for any questions that you all may have for staff. We'll start over in San Rafael. Are there any questions from directors there? All right, hearing that. It looks like uh, Director Wilkinson has her hand raised. Thank you. I'm sorry to have so many questions today. Um, I'd love to understand a little bit more about how um, dynamic rates actually work. Does that mean that they are adaptive to the exact demand supply imbalance at any point in time or how exactly does that work? I will defer this question uh, to Justin. Thank you, um, a great question. Thank you so much. Um, how, so dynamic pricing would mean that there is a complex mechanism that takes into account the current market conditions and the current wholesale prices of power. Um, usually the thinking is that this would be done in what's called the day ahead market and that those prices would be incorporated into a unified pricing signal that would change on an hourly or sub hourly basis. Um, now, there is a lot of room for different versions of, of doing that with different levels of exposure for customers to that market, whether it be just for a limited part of their load, such as for electric vehicle charging, or for an entire business's load at their discretion. Um, 
So when you say that, and I realize that it can't be implemented right now, you don't have the data, but when you say that you don't think it would, I think you said materially reduce peak load, that seems surprising to me. If, if there were effective mechanisms to communicate to customers, it would seem a very standard economic model that it would actually reduce peak load. So I'm curious to know why that isn't the case. That, that's a complex question. I mean, there have been a lot of different looks at time-dependent pricing. Um, certainly, we already have what we call time-of-use pricing, where prices are different and higher between the 4 to 9 p.m. period. That's been shown to be a really effective way to um, motivate customers to shift a portion of their load. Um, Europe, in particular, is known for having much more complex dynamic pricing and has found that it's very effective in driving customer load. In the U.S., there have only been a few programs that have really looked at um, hourly sort of time variant dynamic pricing. Um, the results of those programs, to my knowledge, are actually very similar to what you see under time of use. So, um, you know, we're continuing to look at these programs, um, but there's a lot of discussion, too. And you have to weigh sort of some issues of how much you know, risk are you are you potentially placing on a customer by being exposed to a, a real-time energy market versus the potential benefits of, of being able to um, share the value of shifting load out of peak periods? If I, if I may add to that as well, I think um, specifically what we say in the, in the plan too is it, it's hard to tell there would be material incremental Productions to peak load beyond the rates we have now, and I think in particularly, uh, in particular, in conjunction with automation, I think you're right. The key is the automation, uh, and what we don't have the data right now to show is that it's actually, you know, the hourly rate signal or just the ability to automate and shift your load that creates the response. And so, before we roll out these type these hourly rates we would like to see some some more data on the effectiveness of the rate signal versus the automation if that helps and i was just thinking about it from a from a risk profile even when this uh does come into being um and P and consumers are actively trading their energy effectively um what does that mean for mce's risk Could you maybe clarify your question? I, I, actually, I haven't thought, it, I don't know that I can. Um, it was more just if, you know, you've procured certain amounts of energy and maybe you're not aware of people's battery storage and then they start trading that onto the grid and you're also trying to supply electricity at the same time. I was just curious, what, what the is there a dynamic there to think through or is there, I'm, uh, I'm talking rubbish? <laughs> no, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think that really gets into how you design the pricing signal. I think that's why there's been such a focus on tying it to the, you know, the, the statewide prices administered um, by CAISO, because that that's essentially what the cost is going to be or the value is going to be to us. And so aligning those makes sure that any sort of benefits we're potentially paying out towards a customer for shifting load out of peak would be commensurate with the the value that we'd be receiving um, of that load shifting. That's great. Thank you so much. Director Beckman has his hand raised. Thank you. Um, Justin, I was curious, uh, with these dynamic rates, what are the variables that do or can influence pricing? Is it primarily based on like supply and demand and and like ergo time of day or or can like the cleanness and greenness of the energy mix that's currently available at a given point in time influence price as well that's a great question and, and we had a wonderful graphic earlier i think to illustrate that um you can see when energy is really abundant and it may even power supply may exceed what the demand is the price the wholesale market price may be very low in fact it may be negative and that's something that we've seen a lot over the last month um so and that can be one way that it's passed through um in particular when you get into the peak period in that four to nine period the cost can be very high um you, know, you saw in that graphic too that additional resources had to be brought on to cover that load and there are also fossil fuel resources resources that we particularly don't want to use um there are other aspects too some of them are done um more on kind of a year ahead basis of uh, resource adequacy we've talked about um 
well, with your board considerably and how that's becoming a, a larger and larger cost every year. Um, that is based on our peak load. So to the degree we can get customers to reduce our peak load by shifting power out of those particular intervals, um, we would see a benefit to lower power supply costs as an organization. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, Sabrina, as well. Do we have any public comments um, via Zoom? All right. I see no raised hands, Chair. All right. Thank you. Um, before we move forward, just want to make sure we didn't have any um, comments from directors here in Concord either. All right. Do we have a motion um, on this item? I'll move any? to approve. Director Second. Darling. Second. Motion by Director Darling. Second. Second by Director Bailey. And please call roll. Belvedere? Yes. Concord? Yes. Puerto Madera? Yes. Danville? Yes. Al Cerrito? Yes. Fairfax? Yes. Hercules? Yes. Lafayette? Yes. County of Marin? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Napa? Oh, sorry about that. I miss Moraga. Aye. Thank you. Napa? Yes. The County of Napa and Four Napa Cities? Yes. Novato? Yes. Oakley? Yes. Pinal? Yes. Pittsburgh? Yes. Pleasant Hill? Yes. Richmond? Yes. San Anselmo? Yes. San Pablo? Yes. San Ramon? Yes. Tiburon? Yes. Walnut Creek? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So that was our last action item for this evening. Um, our next item is um, a legislative update um, from MCE's Director of Legislative Affairs, Stephanie Chen. Thank you so much, Chair, and good evening, Directors. Um, can we pull up the PowerPoint, please? Excellent. And then jump right to the next slide, if you could. We'll just dig right in here. Thank you. Um, so at this point in the session, we are just about at the halfway mark, right? like the two minute warning for the first half. Um, and both houses have wrapped up their appropriations work today. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of bills stalled out at this point, given what the budget picture is looking like for next year, uh, which we will talk about in a couple of slides. Um, but from this point on, bills that made it through today um, will go on to floor votes next week in their house of origin. And then after Memorial Day, they will flip over to the second house House where they will start in, in policy committees. Um, next slide, please. So these are the bills on which MCE has taken support positions to date. And thus far, I'm actually happy to report that we have not taken any formal opposed positions and we've not taken any positions that call for amendments. So the only public positions that we've taken so far, knock on wood, are um, our support positions, which is always a, a place where I like to be. Um, SB 1130 by Senator Bradford would expand eligibility for FARA, which is an electric discount program for families that make a little bit too much to qualify for care. It provides an 18% discount on electric rates, and it's currently available to households of three or more people that earn between 200 and 250% of the federal poverty level. 
This bill would allow households of one or two people within that same income level to enroll as well. And not only does that provide a discount for more low-income customers, which we know is really important given the rates that folks are facing right now, but it also helps more customers be eligible for programs that are specifically available for care and FARA customers. Um, SB 1095 by Senator Becker uh, would take several steps to enable electrification for mobile and manufactured homes. These homes are subject to a whole different set of regulations on the kinds of appliances they can use. And some of the current rules make electrification difficult or in some instances impossible. Um, unfortunately, though, this bill was held in appropriations today, so it won't be moving forward this year. AB 3062 by Assemblymember Bauer Cahan requires utilities to provide 24 hours notice to a local fire districts when they're conducting a controlled or prescribed burn for vegetation management within the footprint of that fire district. Um, mm -hmm. Assemblymember Bauer Cahan represents parts of Contra Costa County and MCE supported a similar bill when she introduced it two years ago. Uh, SB 1221 by Senator Min would enable neighbor neighborhood level electrification pilots in communities where the gas distribution system is due for significant repairs or upgrades and needs a lot of money sunk into it to make those investments. So this bill would make it easier for the community and the utility to invest in electrification as an alternative to investing more money into the gas distribution system. Um, Electrifying a whole neighborhood, as I think we can imagine, is pretty complex, um, but it's also the most cost-effective way in the aggregate to switch as a state from gas to electric. And it also helps to ensure that lower-income customers and renters aren't going to be the last customers that are left on the gas system and left paying for the whole gas system as other customers who have more financial resources go ahead and electrify it and pull off of that system. Uh, this too, here, MCE also su uh, supported a prior version of this bill last year. And then finally, SB 1014 by Senator Dodd, who is also part of MCE's delegation. This bill would establish a strategic planning process for wildfire mitigation across the many, many entities that have a stake in these efforts, including mm -hmm. federal, state, local, tribal governments, IOUs, and non-governmental organizations. Through better coordination and planning, this bill aims to maximize safety and wildfire risk reduction in the most cost-effective way possible. And because wildfire mitigation costs are one of the most significant drivers of IOU rate increases, we're hoping that better coordination can help put some downward pressure on those costs without sacrificing safety. This bill did make it out of appropriations today, but it's going to be amended to, to narrow its scope a bit, so we'll be keeping an eye out to see what those amendments look like. Next slide, please. So... On this, this set of watch list bills, MCE hasn't taken a formal position, but we have weighed in informally, either directly or through CalCCA. Um, these first two you have heard about um, in a previous presentation earlier this year. SB 1305 by Senator Stern would have required a study of the statewide potential for virtual power plants, and it also would have established a VPP procurement mandate for the IOUs. This bill drew some pretty strong opposition, and it didn't, didn't make it out of the Senate Energy Committee. SB 1508, also by Senator Stern, would have established a procurement mandate for all LSEs, including CCAs, for long duration and multi-day storage. And multi-day storage is at this point a very new and very untested read expensive technology at this point. Um, MCE and other CCAs were quite uncomfortable with the proposal of a procurement mandate, um, but the bill has since been scaled back to just require the PUC to model those technologies in future iterations of the uh, integrated resources planning uh, process. Um, AB 2368 by Assemblymember Petrie Norris calls for better alignment between the PUC's IRP and RA programs. Um, Assemblymember Petrie Norris is the chair of the Assembly Utilities Committee this year, and in that role, she has presided over multiple oversight hearings that are focusing on issues like reliability and affordability, where these programs have been discussed um, at pretty significant length. Now, 
MCE does believe that these two programs could and should be better aligned um, because it will help us, you know, it'll be make it easier for us to comply in both programs. But the PUC is working on exactly this issue right now and will be doing so over the next several months. And as a result of that ongoing work, we don't believe that this bill is necessary at this particular time. We think that the PUC process should be allowed to play out. And then we can take a look afterwards to see whether there's any cleanup that is needed and whether a bill might be appropriate at that time. And on this bill, we are engaging through CalCCA um, to have some conversations with the author's office about our perspective on this. And then last, AB 1999 by Assemblymember Irwin and a large handful of co-authors. Um, this is one of several bills that were introduced this year to try to repeal the PUC's authority to implement an income graduated fixed charge, which the legislature approved just two years ago in a budget trailer bill. Here, too, because the, the proposal for an income graduated fixed charge impacts different customers and different communities in MCE's service area in different ways. We haven't taken a position, but we engaged with our delegation to just share a bit more of our information and analysis about how this, how the proposals that were on the table might impact their constituents and our customers. Um, this bill did not get out of appropriations today, so it won't be advancing this year. Uh, next slide, please. To the budget. Um, so process-wise, you may recall that in January every year, the governor releases his first draft budget proposal, and then in May, he issues what is known as the May Revise. So the May Revise came out last week, and this is basically the governor's final draft budget. From this point on, the legislature takes over from here. Um, and the, the difference between the January draft and the May draft reflect, one, um, more accurate revenue projections, and then two, also probably takes into account um, the opinions that were expressed by the legislature as they held hearings over the spring on the January budget. So this year, the governor's budget is trying to close a deficit of about $45 billion. So pretty big, pretty big project ahead of him there. Because there is such a big gap to close this year, the legislature and the administration came to an agreement last month that they're calling shrink the shortfall. And that includes about $17 billion in cuts, delays, and funding shifts that were among the less controversial proposals and the ones that garnered the most consensus from that January draft. So the May revise is addressing the remaining shortfall of just about $28 billion for the state fiscal year 24-25, which starts in July. Um, and because we are projected to have uh, some deficits of roughly $30 billion for at least the next couple of years, is my understanding, um, this proposal also looks a, a bit ahead into fiscal year 25-26 to start to address some of, the, um, some of the shortfall there as well. In the area of climate and clean energy spending, we have seen some outright cuts, uh, as well as delays in multi-year funding that was promised a couple of years ago when the budget was in significant surplus. We're also seeing a, an increasing reliance on cap-and-trade auction revenues for priorities like renewable energy, transit projects, zero-emission vehicles, and a handful of equity programs. Um, and I think in, in many of the places where we are seeing cuts or seeing changes, those also happen to overlap with areas where California is drawing down federal money from the Inflation Reduction Act and, and other measures as well. So I think there is really a recognition that climate and clean energy are still a priority for the administration, and they're just having to make some really tough choices at this point. Um, we're also continuing to hear rumors of a possible climate bond on the November ballot. There's also discussion of potentially an education bond and a housing bond, um, but we have not seen any details yet. Nothing has been made public on that yet. Um, in terms of next steps here, the legislative budget committees will hold hearings on the May revise over the next few weeks. And then uh, by June 15th, the legislature has a constitutional deadline to pass a budget bill uh, by that date. Otherwise, they don't get paid. So they will pass a budget bill by that date. Um, but as we have seen in years past, it's probably going to be more of a skeleton, like the high level outline of, of a budget bill. And then additional details will get filled in over the rest of the summer. Um, next slide, please. I think that actually might have been the end. And that is, in fact, the end. Um, thank you. Happy to take any questions.
I, I had one quick question about the climate bond. Is it legislative bond, not initiative? Yeah, it would be a legislative bond. So if that's going to be on the November ballot, I think it has to get wrapped up next month. So we're hoping to hear something about that soon. <clears throat> yeah, I have a question. Uh, and maybe it's a bill that just didn't get anywhere or it's part of a trailer bill. But the issue of uh, price vol volatility and the fact that we are buying power, renewable energy and others outside of state and the volatility of pricing because it's basically supply and demand. And I think the goal was to try to get something legislatively done to create oversight on managing the pricing that we would be able to purchase energy for instead of uh, paying whatever is market rate. Do you know if uh, there's any movement on that? I have not seen any vehicles on that. Where I, where we have seen a lot of attention is um, addressing the costs of the transmission and distribution system, but but less on on the actual uh, pricing of the commodity itself. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions from directors in San Rafael or via Zoom for Stephanie? I see no raised hands, Chair, either in San Rafael or on Zoom. Uh, Chair, I actually have a few questions. Director Zorn. Thanks. Uh, first off, can you uh, explain a little bit about income graduated fixed charge and give an example? Yes. So the income graduated fixed charge would take some of the costs that don't vary from month to month, mm -hmm. like having a meter. Um, and it would take those costs and pull the costs out of volumetric rates, the per kilowatt hour rates, and move them into a fixed charge that would be the same month to month. So by moving those charges, you can actually reduce the volumetric rate for the actual electrons themselves. Um, and by income graduated, we mean that care customers would pay the lowest, FARA customers would pay a little bit higher, and then everybody else would pay a, a, a bit of a higher rate. And that is not in effect as of right now, right? So the PUC actually did just adopt, I believe it was last week, they did vote out a uh, a decision on that, but it has not been implemented yet. So okay. you won't see that in your rates. Okay. Um, and then my other question, oh, sorry, do you want to follow up on it? Yes. Yeah, right, right exactly. <laughs> right. Um, and then, well, that's a good point. Yet that was more ominous than what I was thinking, but <laughs> yet meaning that income graduated means that someone will pay less, but other people will in effect have to pay more. Yes. To even out. Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's not so much to even out necessarily mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, the utility collects its, its revenue requirement. And these are all happening on the mm -hmm. utility side of the bill. This is not going to impact any of MCE's charges or, or oh, rates. Right. It's all happening on the, on the utility side of the bill. Um, but what it does recognize is that lower income customers have a harder time affording bills mm -hmm. and lower income customers also typically, but not always end up being, uh, lower users, uh, lower volume mm -hmm. users. Um, but there's, you know, some, there's exceptions everywhere there, right? For example, uh, lower income customers who are living in super hot climates where you need air conditioning mm -hmm. to live, you know, often end up facing bills that are that are much higher than what they can afford. And so the income graduated fixed charge seeks to to alleviate some of the pressure on those customers um, in addition to some other goals as well. Thank you. Um, and then my other question uh, was with respect to some of the, your first slide was had several items regarding electrification and specifically uh, SB 1095. So I think I'm sure other jurisdictions here did the same thing over the past year. We passed a local ordinance prohibiting gas ranges and new construction to try to uh, incentivize people to put in electric ranges and new construction. And then there was some court case that basically said, actually, you can't do that. So then we all rushed around to uh, invalidate all of our ordinances. So uh, are is any of that conversation impacting any of these electrification uh, bills that you mentioned? You know, not Directly, we don't see, and by that I mean we don't see a legislative response specifically to mm -hmm. that decision. But what a lot of these bills are doing, you know, these bills from this year as well as bills that we've supported in the past, you know, the the ban is sort of the stick approach, mm -hmm. right? And and a lot of these other bills are looking to create incentives or make, change rules to make it easier to electrify, and those are really sort of on the carrot side mm -hmm. of things. And I think if 
if that court case hadn't happened and if the ban, you know, were to stay in place mm-hmm. or if if the BACMED uh, phase out that the the gentleman who made public comment earlier was referencing, if those stay in effect, those incentive programs are going to be really important to make sure that, again, you know, lower income customers, renters, some of the, the folks who have a little bit less control over what kind of appliances they're buying um, don't uh, don't wind up really getting harmed by those mm-hmm. by those policies. So I think we, we really need need both and um and MCE is is very much in favor of the the programs that provide incentives there mm-hmm. particularly for lower income customers thank you thank you Jessica do we have any public <clears throat> public comment via zoom i see no raised hands chair all right well that will move us on to our last agenda item since that was a discussion item um are there um any board members or staff members have any items that they would like to discuss all right seeing none here in conquer jessica any hands raised or lights none on in, over there none in san rafael or online thanks all right well, that would bring us to the end of our evening. This was a quick board meeting. Uh, <laughs> I would like to uh, I would like to adjourn the meeting at seven fifty nine p.m. Um, thank you all, and have a great evening. <laughs>